National Spinach Day. Um, it's a bit loud now. Can you turn it down a little bit? Please. It's Good Hair Day. Tim? Praise the Lord. Epilepsy Awareness Purple Day. Bangladesh Independence Day. Live Long and Prosper Day. Those Star Trekkers. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, National Nougat Day. Who likes Nougat? National Nougat Day. Nougat. It's Nougat. Um, National Day of Life, Peace and Justice. Uh, this is my wife's favourite one. Solitude Day. She's always complaining that now I'm retired, I'm in the house all the time, so I'm never not there. So she's glad I'm going to my mother's for a couple of days next week. Wear a hat day. Any hats? No? Wear a hat day. This is, make up your own holiday day. And finally, it's my brother's birthday. <laughs> he will be three years younger than me, 56 today. He's younger than me, fitter than me, better looking than me, and he's got more hair. No, no, it's, it's worse than that. <laughs> um, so it's his birthday today. And, you know, it made me think about that. You know, you, we can say, can't we, there's a saying that says you can choose your friends, but your family you're stuck with. Is that right? That's the, that's the saying, isn't it? You can choose your friends, but your family you're stuck with. And we had Mother's Day last week and heard about Jonathan's story um, with the horse <clears throat> in, the, in the field and the red bucket with the yellow handle, just to show you that I did listen to the sermon last week. Um, and uh, yeah, so last week was Mothering Sunday. But you see, church is sort of in between those two. Yes, we're friends, but also we're family. We're in this big family of God. I remember um, we sing a chorus in the 80s. I love this family of God, so closely knitted into one. They've taken me into their heart, and I'm so glad to be a part of that great fam or this great family. Anybody remember that one? No, Haley does. Pete Bailey should remember this one. But most of the time, we get on, don't we? Yeah? Hello? Come on, it's interactive this morning. Most of the time, we get on. But sometimes, it's not so easy. And you see, God knew all this. When, he wrote, when we wrote the word, he said, look, you know, there's going to be times when you go get on. Here's the guidelines of how to deal with it. He said, if someone has a problem with you, what have you got to do? And if you've got a problem with someone, what do you do? Go to them. Exactly. So there's no excuse. Whatever the situation, the ball's in your court. Whoever you are, to go and deal with it. So God was saying, look, you can't let these things fester. You've just got to get on with it. No, I'm not saying there's any issues today. But it's just a reminder that as family, we need to deal with those things when they happen. I, um, I've had a situation recently with a lady I've really struggled with and things have gone a bit and I felt quite hurt about the situation and uh, you know I had to go to the Lord and say Lord I'm sorry for holding unforgiveness towards this person and I forgive them for what's happened to me and God has set me free from that no more do I feel that pain because it can be painful family relationship can be painful can't they Two weeks ago, Jonathan spoke on what's my ministry. The week before that, Tim spoke on including faith and works. And then three weeks, four weeks ago, 26th of February, I spoke on what body part are you? No, it wasn't. It was before that. What body part are you? So there's a bit of a, bit of a theme running through, not every week. but uh, So the last time I spoke was on the resurrection of Lazarus and Jesus, and ourselves. Do you remember that? Does anybody, does everybody remember it? Great. God, 
Anybody on this side remember it? There was a choir on the cheap seats over here. So, but there's an in-between, because it's in-between week. There's an in-between. There's in-between, um, between that bit of knowing what your ministry is and getting to glory. It's called doing church. It's called living our lives. It's called working out this faith that we have. It's called being God's child in this world. Fulfilling God's plans and purposes in our lives. It's called being part of the family. Amen? Yeah, between knowing what we've got to do and glory, there's the doing bit. Making it happen. Living their lives out. And that can be a challenge. It's not always easy. You know, I loved Jonathan's take on Pete and Jean, the great drain rodders. Unlocking the way to salvation. Uh, here we go, here we go. Broad is the pipe that doesn't block and leads to destruction, but narrow is the pipe that blocks easily and leads to life. <laughs> you see, Jesus said many encouraging things to help us live our lives in the family of God. He said, come to me, all you who are weary. So he said, Matthew 11, 18 to 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is comfortable and my burden is light. Isn't that wonderful to know that we can, we can take that burden, we can get rid of the burden that we have, and we can take the burden on that Jesus gives to us, and that burden that yoke is comfortable, that burden is light, and we can have rest and be unburdened from the challenges of life. These things, John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you so that you may, so that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. Um, I have overcome the world. Matthew 6, 25, this is one of my favorite go-to passages you know when life's a challenge when you know you're worrying about something I, I try not to worry Jesus says don't worry don't worry don't worry don't fear and so on and so on. but as a natural human being that's something we do naturally and so we have to go to him we have to deal with this worry isn't the best for us fear is not the best for us for this reason I say to you do not worry be worried about your life what you will eat or drink nor for your body what you will put on is life, not more than food and the body more than clothing. Do not worry about that saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Hebrews 13.5 For he himself says, I will never desert you or leave you and nor will I abandon you. God is with us all the time. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. No, it, I am, um, confession time, I, this week, on Tuesday afternoon, sat in my living room, did my speed awareness course. Having been caught doing a little bit over the speed limit, I did my speed awareness course. Um, I remember as a young Christian, people saying to me, oh, if you speed, Jesus gets out the car. Fortunately, that is not biblical. Okay? Doesn't mean to say that I'm advocating that we do, because I'm a changed man now. I made a New Year's resolution, I would not speed, and I still haven't. Well, only when you're going down a hill and you have to put the brakes on. You know what I mean? 
you, you, you've got to control the car. So I haven't, I haven't deliberately gone over the speed limit, but, you know. Um, but Jesus doesn't get out of the car. He says, I never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I will never abandon you. Peter tells us in Peter 5, Peter, 1 Peter 5, 6, 7, Therefore humble yourselves unto the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, having cast all your anxiety. Hello? Having cast all your cares or all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So knowing all this encouragement, knowing all these things that God says to us, he'll never leave us, forsake us. He's got a yoke and a burden which is light. He says, yeah, you can have trouble in this world, but I've overcome the world. He says, take it upon me, come to me, cast all your cares upon me. Don't need to worry because I'm in charge. That's a good picture, isn't it? Hello? It's a good picture. Knowing all this encouragement and support from God, what response does God expect from us? What does God expect from us in order for us to make this Christian life work? To be that body part, to fulfill that ministry, to fulfill both faith and works or faith and deeds, to complete the plans that God has for you and me. What response does he expect from us? To achieve the purpose that you were created for. Created for purpose, you're not an accident here this morning. On time, oh, not everybody. You're not an accident. Purposely created, you were to fulfill God's plans for your life. To get to that place where he will say to you, you stand before him in glory, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. What does he want from us for that? Uh, everything. 100% total commitment. That's what he wants from us. That's what he wants from us. Everything. You see, Romans 12, verse 1 says this. We often talk about Romans 12 too, about renewing our mind. But sometimes I think we skip over. It's a skip over, that first verse. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters... Hello, brother, sister, brother, sister, and so on. Brother, sister, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. God expects 100%. There is no such thing as 125%. Oh, they gave 150% on that p n nonsense. There's nothing greater than 100%. He expects it all. Total commitment. But what does it mean to sacrifice? Okay. The killing of a victim on an altar. Something offered in sacrifice. Destruction or surrender of something for the sake of something else. Give up something valued for the sake of other considerations. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. I mean, we, I don't know that we talk about much sacrifice. Yeah, we talk about lots of other things, but sacrifice. You know, we see that picture of sacrifice with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham going up the mountain with his son. God has told him to sacrifice his son, his only son. He takes him up the mountain and Isaac saying, Dad, where is the sacrifice? He said, don't worry, son, God will provide. Don't worry, son, God will provide. He was prepared to go all the way. He was prepared to kill the most precious thing he had. His son of promise. Remember that God had said to uh, Abraham that you will have a son and, and from your son you're going to fill the earth and you're going to bless the whole world and you're going to do all these amazing things and he jumped the gun didn't he he jumped the gun 
And, uh, and then Isaac came along in his very, 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 very old age. Nearly as old as Pete. Old age. Isaac was born. But Abraham believed God. He believed that even if he did sacrifice his son, that God was able to raise him from the dead. God was able to lift him up. God was able to bring him back to life. He was prepared to go all the way. And at the point he's about to stab his son and kill him, God said, whoa, 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 stop. I Now I know, Abraham, that you really are prepared to go all the way. There's no thing you, nothing that you wouldn't do for me. And he stops him just in the act of bringing that knife down. Yeah? He believed God could even raise him from the dead again. Question for us this morning. I'm not expecting an answer, so you don't need to shout it out. What about us? When was the last time we sacrificed something for Jesus? When was the last time that we were prepared to lay down something that was precious to us, something that was important to us? You know, sacrifice is only sacrifice if it means something. If it's easy or if it doesn't mean it, it's not sacrifice. It's got to be something worthwhile. It's got to be something that we really hold on to. Jesus talked about the woman who, who was very poor in the temple, she, the widow's might. She had very, very little. She, he saw all the people giving in the temple, giving out of their wealth. Now, I'm not just saying this is about finances as a treasurer, but <laughs> that's not the reason why I'm sharing this bit. But out of their wealth, they gave. Out of her poverty, she gave. Everything that she had, two small coins everything that she had she gave a hundred percent total commitment you know when I first became a Christian I was convicted that I needed to do things about my stuff I used to love reading books well I still love reading books but I used to love reading horror books by Stephen King or by James Herbert and all these you know and God convicted me said those are your idols you need to deal with them. You need to get rid of them. Oh, how could I do that? They're mine. But I had to let them go. My record collection, you know, I had some great records. I had Shaking Stevens, Blondie, no, none of that, no, no. Shawaddy Waddy, all these amazing groups, amazing groups, the amazing darts. Again, they were my idols. And I had to get, now, they may seem trivial, small things, but at that time, that was important to me. But I was prepared to give those away to the, to the charity shop or so, just because I wanted that freedom, and God set me free. Now, I'm not advocating that you've got to go home and get rid of all your books and your record collection. No, that's not what I'm saying. But to me... It was a sacrifice. To me, it was idolatry. It was, to me, it was something I had to deal with. And we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's, he's praying and interceding. He knows what's coming. He knows what's coming. And he's praying. It said that his, his sweat was like drops of blood, or became drops of blood. It was that painful for him, knowing what was coming. And he said, take this cup from me if you can. But not my will, but yours be done. And that should be our response. Not my will, but yours be done, God. Whatever it is. In the words of the great hymn, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me Jesus. Take me now. All to Jesus make me saviour. Holy thine. Sorry, all to Jesus I surrender. Make me saviour. Holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit. 
truly know thou, that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Saviour. I surrender all. Last night, we went to see a film at the cinema. Alleluia. Really good film, really enjoyable. Definitely worth going to see. But there was a phrase that was said in the film which really responded, resounded with me. Love has no cost. Love has no cost. And I thought, you know, that's not strictly true. I, I understand that to love somebody doesn't cost you anything to love somebody. Yeah? Well, in a sense, it does. Well, love does cost. In two weeks' time, we are going to celebrate the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made. In two weeks' time, we're going to celebrate the most costly act of love. We're going to celebrate that Jesus went to that cross and he did it for love. No other reason. Love for you, for you and me. And that whole world out there, which is our ministry, whether it's Park End or Colford or Westbury or Newnham or Cinderford, wherever it may be, he laid down his life for us, our ministry. Jesus gave his life that we might live because he loves you. But God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. And when we look at 1 Corinthians 13, which is often talked about during somebody getting married, but it's not meant to be specifically for marriage, even though it's very, very important and it should be something which we think about. But he's talking about us as church. 1 Corinthians 13 is between the spiritual gifts and the ministry gifts and all those things that happen in church. He's saying love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Does not brag. Is not arrogant. Does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It's not provoked. Does not keep an account of wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in all things. Keeps everything in confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, and endure all things. And then, he says, love never fails. You see, love does cost. It does cost. If it's really love, it costs Jesus his life. It will cost us to sacrifice. You know, we read earlier in 1 Peter 5, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And then in Matthew 6, we read, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, humility is very rarely heard of. Oh, oh we hear a lot about pride. But especially sports people, oh, I'm so proud of my achievements. I'm so proud of what I've achieved. I'm so proud, I'm really, really proud of myself. Don't we hear this? A lot? Hello? Of course, we're all good quiet here. Don't we hear this a lot about pride? I'm proud, really proud. I've achieved. I'm proud of myself. Where God says, humble ourselves before God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. It's great when people say to us, good stuff, well done. You've done a great job. Excellent. Superb. It's good to encourage one another. It's good to build one another up. It's not wrong, but we've got to keep it in perspective. We're all fallen human beings. Hello? Yeah? We all need God's help, and we all need his support. Amen? We cannot live, even though it is isolation day, we cannot live this life in isolation. We were created for relationship with him and with one another. That's how God created us, perfect in his image, but for relationship. You know, I want to hear one day when I get to heaven, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your earth. That should be our goal, to fulfill the purposes and plans of God, 
to live our life in humility and sacrifice, to be prepared to do the hard yards, to graft, to do things that we don't necessarily like to do, rodding the drains, yeah? The great train, sorry, not train, the great drain rodders. You see what the, pl the play was? Did you get that? The great train rodders. The things that are difficult, the things that are challenging for us, out of our comfort zone, out of areas that we're comfortable with. Yeah? I want to hear God say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. How will I fulfill my ministry? How will you fulfill your ministry? How will I fulfill the purpose that God has for me? How will you fulfill the purpose that God has for you? It's that commitment, that 100%, that sacrifice in humility, being prepared to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. You know, God sacrificed his son for us so that we might have life. You know, we have to give our all back, don't we? Give our 100% back. We can play at church, we can play at being Christians, we can dip our toe in, we might even put a whole foot in, or, or a leg, you know, or an arm. He says all. He says all. No ifs and buts, all. We're going to sing that hymn, if, our, if it works. Even if we can, can't, play the, can't play the music. I, I think we should just stay seated and sing this prayerfully because afterwards I just want us to I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or stand up or whatever you know what's going on in your own life you know the challenges you have in your own life you know those things which perhaps hold on, hold on to you that you can't let go all to Jesus I surrender all to him let's sing this <laughs>